Thank you, guys. Being this worship today. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's great to see you. Um, we're going to spend a little bit of time looking in God's Word in Philippians chapter four uh, today, predominantly. Um, let's pray before we open God's Word together. Uh, Lord, thank you so much for your presence with us today. Uh, thank you that um, that you inhabit the praises of your people. Thank you that you're here with us now. With each believer you indwell personally, with us as a church, you're here amongst us. And we pray, Holy Spirit, would you lead us as we look at your word today? Um, just give us eyes to see things afresh and things from God's perspective. Give us hearts, Lord, that are soft and receptive. And give us a, a will that is willing to be shaped by you and led by your truth. Uh, Lord, we want to be people who are authentic and genuine as believers in Jesus. Disciples who follow Jesus all the days of our life with increasing joy and with increasing maturity. And we pray as we look in your word today that you'd lead us and guide us um, in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, wonderful. Let's uh, look in, uh, in chapter four. Uh, we're going to have to we're going to have to go back a little bit for the context of chapter four, because it starts like this. Uh, you'll see on the screen here uh, on the next slide. Therefore, chapter four, verse one, therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. And uh, whenever you see a sentence that starts with therefore in scripture, it's always good to ask, what is that therefore? Um, because there's always a context, there's always a reason why Paul says, therefore. So we just have to go back a little bit. And particularly if you're, um, you've just come to church today and you're just arriving into the middle of a, of a or towards the end of a teaching series, it's obviously hard to make sense. If the rest of us have been working way through chapters one, two, three, we're into chapter four, we've got a sense of why the therefore is there. But let me just give you a little bit of the background why this this, uh, this verse is there, why Paul says, therefore. So immediately before that, and uh, if you got a chance, go back onto our, uh, if you weren't here last week, go back onto our YouTube channel and uh, have a look at the video of our service last week. Catherine was teaching from Philippians chapter three, and we finished with these words. It says, um, verse 19, speaking about those who don't follow Jesus, their mind is set on earthly things, the things of the here and now things all around us. But Paul says, but our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, he will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Yeah, this is an amazing truth. It's, it's, it's taught here in a very shorthand kind of summarized way. But Paul teaches about this truth that, that as Christians, um, having put our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ, um, God teaches us that we have become new creation. We become a new creation. We're new in him because we have received the Holy Spirit. And the life of God has come into our life to transform us. And right now, as Paul teaches us in the book of 2 Corinthians, um, he teaches about this in a lot more detail in chapters 3, 4, and 5 in 2 Corinthians. But he teaches us there that we are new creation in Christ. He says the old is gone, the new has come, thanks be to God. Amen? Aren't you glad about that, right? <laughs> we are new creation right here and right now. The kingdom of God, just as Jesus taught, has come on earth as it is in heaven, not yet perfectly, but authentically and truly and really. And we have become those who have experienced the kingdom of God break into our lives right here and right now. God says you are now a new creation in Christ. The spirit is indwelling you. And in chapter 33, he teaches in 2 Corinthians, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom and liberty for the people of God. And when we contemplate the Lord's glory, we are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory. Not perfectly, but authentically and truly, we are starting to be transformed into the likeness 
of Jesus because we have the Holy Spirit indwelling us. God is making us more like him. There's a process of transformation that's going on in your life and in mine. And I'm really grateful for that. You know, I know that I'm not what I could be, but I'm not what I used to be because Jesus is starting to change and transform me slowly. Sometimes, I'll admit, it feels like two steps forward and one step back, right? But as you look back over the years, you want to say, thank you, Lord, for a work of transformation that's going on in my life and I can see it in other people's lives. Actually, genuinely, sometimes it's easier to see transformation in other people's lives than it is in your own, right? So it's good for us to say to our brothers and sisters, I can see the work of God transforming you into the likeness of Christ. Because to be honest, we all need that encouragement, don't we? Okay, and Paul teaches there that it's a bit like having treasure in jars of clay because we are so sense, we're so aware of our weakness and our brokenness. But we have this treasure that's come from God and we're really grateful for that. And... Uh, and then he says, he says that um, uh, he says that do not lose heart, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Paul wants us to look not only at the here and now and what God is doing now, but also to look ahead to what is yet to come, the full, technicolor, glorious realization of the kingdom of God come in reality, when we get to see Jesus face to face and we are completely and perfectly transformed into his likeness, yeah? So he says, so we fix our eyes on what is, not on what is seen, but what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, yet what is unseen is eternal and unchanging. And it says in chapter five, in 2 Corinthians chapter five, we groan awaiting our new bodies, at the day of resurrection, don't you? <laughs> the Holy Spirit is a depositing guarantee in what is yet to come. And Paul teaches that the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first to meet him in the air, and so we will be like him when we see him face to face. There's going to be a day of resurrection for us like there was a day of resurrection for Jesus. And our bodies will be changed. And we'll be made like him. Physical transformation. Perfect bodies like Jesus for a new creation, the new heaven and the new earth. That's why Paul teaches in Philippians chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. And we've thought previously what it means to stand firm in the Lord. You, know, you look in chapter, chapter one of Philippians, Paul says, whatever happens, you'll see it on the screen here, yeah? Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ as you await the day of the Lord's coming. Don't lose sight of the Lord's return because this is not the end of our journey. The best, brothers and sisters, is yet to come, Amen. So we travel with hope. We travel with anticipation. But as we travel, the Lord teaches us, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. There, then whether I come, Paul says, or see you only or hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm together in one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. So back to Philippians chapter four. That will make sense now. Chapter 4, verse 1, therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. Stand firm in the Lord with this sure and certain hope of the resurrection and the future glory of the resurrection of the people of God yet to come. Stand firm in that hope, but also stand firm in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus right now. Striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. God, Paul has placed a lot of emphasis on our unity because our unity will reflect the character of God who is unified and calls us to be one as we strive for the gospel. 
So he starts to address two particular women in the church now. And this is the first time he's done this in this whole letter. Verse two. So he says, I plead with Yodia and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, doesn't mention who it is. There's been lots of speculation about that, but he doesn't mention who it is. So we won't. Help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Okay. So imagine the church in Philippi. Perhaps they're meeting on a Sunday morning, having church together. And the letter from Paul arrives. And as is happens in the tradition of the early church, when a letter from the apostle arrives, what happens is it's read aloud in the church, right? It's read to the whole church family. That was the intention of these letters. So perhaps the letter arrived during the church service. Everybody sat there. And uh, the guy who's preaching, you know, receives the letter and says, oh, well, we've got a letter from the apostle Paul. <laughs> We're going to read it out. Starts reading chapter one about the glory of the gospel of Jesus. How wonderful it is to be unified. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, be of a like mind with Jesus Christ, who humbled himself and came down and took upon a servant heart. Yeah? Well, that's amazing teaching. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Chapter three. Yeah? About the, about the day that is yet to come, the future glory for the people of God. Thank you, Lord. This is amazing. Into chapter four. Now just think about it. Flipping heck. Imagine yourself to be Yodia or Syntyche sitting in the church that morning, right? And Paul gets to chapter four and this amazing, wonderful pastoral letter. And he says, I plead with you, Yodia. And I plead with you, Syntyche. To be of the same mind in the Lord. Yeah. Now this, this word plead, this is not a harsh word. You know, Paul's not being horrible here, but he is pleading because he thinks it's actually genuinely very, very important, not only for these women, but for the whole church family that the issue is resolved. Yeah, so he pleads with them. And these are prominent women in the church with significant ministries, it seems, who contended alongside Paul in gospel work as his co-workers, he calls them. Women who will be known in the church family, who have done great things. And the reality is that sometimes even the most faithful servants of God get into relationship messes in the church. Yeah? And sometimes we're slow to sort things out. And sometimes that can have a kind of toxic effect, not only on them and their relationship, but on the whole church family. Yeah? That sometimes happens, sadly. And Paul cares so much about these women, and he cares about the church family, that he takes the risk of, even in a public letter, of pleading with them to make this right in their relationship with each other. I plead with you. It's an intense word. As I say, it's not a harsh word. It's not intended to, um, it's not intended to shame them or diminish them, but it is intended to restore to them God's peace and to restore God's peace to the church family. How will they do it? Well, Paul says that he pleads with them to be of the same mind in the Lord. Now, in a case of disagreement, it's very often easy to have my mind and you have your mind. And that's where the impasse happens, is that we can never get to the point of agreement. And what Paul calls for is for them to be of one mind in the Lord. That's a different place. That means they're asking questions like, would the Lord have us divided over this issue? What would the Lord think about us and our relationship having this impact on the church? 
How would the Lord have us behave towards each other in the family of God? Well, those are different kinds of questions to the question of, am I right or are you right? What's my mind or what's your mind? The call here is to be of one mind in the Lord. That's a different thing, right? That's a much more challenging and hard work thing because it means that we have to get out of our own heads and ask the question, what is the mind of the Lord here? Yeah? That's a good thing to do, though. Because we will discover that the mind of the Lord is that we start to deal with each other with mercy and humility and with generous, uh, with gracious generosity and with love, like he does towards us. And aren't we grateful that God deals with us like that? So when we start to ask the question, Lord, how would you want me to deal with someone else who's part of your family? And he says, well, deal with them the way that I deal with you. When we both start to feel like that and think like that and ask God that question, that brings us to a place where we begin to get to the place where oh, we're of one mind in the Lord rather than two minds in a situation of impasse. And that's what, well, that's what Paul calls for here. And he says, the biggest incentive for you guys is to see each other as part of the family of God under the headship of the Lord himself. And ask yourself the question, how would the Lord have me behave towards my brother or my sister? Yeah. He says that both your names are in the book of life. It's a little interesting addition here. It's only mentioned twice more in, in the Holy Scripture. In Psalm 69, those whose names are in the book of life are those who are called the righteous of the Lord. Those who are part of the, the salvation of God. Those who are righteous in God's eyes. And Yodia, see your sister Syntyche as someone who is the righteous of the Lord, loved by God and made for a relationship with him. Part of the family of God. Syntyche, look at your sister Yodia. Her name is in the book of life, like yours is. This is the greatest incentive towards godly unity. We belong to the eternal family of God, yeah? It's a call to be unified in the Lord. Now he says, I ask you, my true companion, help these women, since there's a lot at stake for them and there's a lot at stake for the church. The call here is to be a peacemaker, right? Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, because they are, they will be called the children of God. And in reality, this is my experience as well, but in reality, where there's disagreement and conflict in the family of God, it is so tempting, especially if you're friends with people, it's so tempting to try to stay out of the way, to not stick your head above the parapet in case it gets shot off, right? Or to try to not get involved in case you somehow get embroiled in the mess. And Paul is actually calling on his friend here to do something that doesn't come naturally to us. He's calling on his friend to get involved. Get involved to restore unity. Help them and remind them that their names are written in the book of life. And brothers and sisters, with that privilege comes responsibility, yeah? Responsibility to, uh, to strive for unity in the spirit and responsibility to conduct ourselves in a way that is worthy of the gospel of Jesus. That's not easy, but it is our call, right? <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Paul says in verse four, rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. Uh, rejoicing in the Lord here, it's like a spiritual discipline to remind ourselves to rejoice in the goodness of God. Whatever our circumstances, whatever, however we feel, Paul says, brothers and sisters in the church in Philippi and the people's church in Partington, rejoice in the Lord. It's almost like a command. It's like rejoice in the Lord. Do it as a spiritual habit of your life. Rejoice in the goodness of God. Because when we start to think about the goodness of God, we will have so much to give God thanks for his character, his faithfulness, his compassion, his mercy, his love, his forgiveness, his salvation, the work that he's done in my life, the work that he's done in our life, 
the work that he's done in the life of the UK and around the world as he brings people from every tribe and nation and family and tongue into the family of God. And we want to say, thank you, Lord. There is so much to be thankful for. So let's, re- let's, uh, let's practice this spiritual discipline. And uh, one, one way to practice that is in our prayer life. Uh, and this is something I've been practicing for a little while now, is before asking God for anything, which is quite often the instinct, you know, you kind of wake up in the morning, you're feeling a certain way, and the instinct is to say, Lord, please help me with this. But a good spiritual discipline is to start with thanksgiving and worship and adoration. And that just sets our hearts at peace within the presence of God. It reminds us who God is and what God is like, that this is a God we can trust, that this is a God that we can give thanks for, that this is a God who's not our spiritual slot machine to give us stuff, but we come before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and we get the privilege to enter into the throne room of God because of the grace of God. And we bow on our knees and we say, thank you, Lord, you are so worthy of our praise and our adoration and our thanksgiving. And as a spiritual discipline, That is an amazing way to start every prayer and every day to remind ourselves, oh, Lord, we are so blessed to be called the children of God. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Another great spiritual discipline is to practice rejoicing in the Lord in our conversations with each other. Yeah. So that our rejoicing of the Lord is never very far away from what we talk about, regardless of how we feel and what our circumstances. I'm going to put a picture on the screen of a guy. I think I might have mentioned this chap before from from the last church um, from Hillcliff. His name is Tom. And uh, that's Tom in the motorized wheelchair there holding a little red umbrella on a rainy day coming back from church. And uh, Tom's body is failing and it has been for many, many years. But uh, when I think about people who rejoice in the Lord, actually, my mind quite often goes to Tom in our church. He's got lots and lots of reasons to be grumpy, and, uh, and, uh, and, and sometimes he is, because his, his, his body does hurt so much at times. But when I think of someone who has made a habit in his conversation with me and with other people of rejoicing in the Lord, my mind goes to Tom. And very often when you chat to Tom, you say, how are you, Tom? And uh, how are you feeling today? And he's got a bit of a phrase that he used. He often says, oh, Stuart, my body is flagging, but the Lord is so good. <laughs> yeah, the Lord is so good. And then he just starts to overflow with what he's been enjoying about the Lord that day. And it just pours out of Tom. And at Hillcliff, I used to say to people, if you're feeling quite low and quite sad, go to our church cafe on a Friday and spend half an hour with the guy in the wheelchair. Because he's made a spiritual habit of rejoicing in the Lord in his conversation. So I know he will bless you. I know he will encourage your faith. I know that he will rejoice in the Lord in your presence. And that will cause you to rejoice in the Lord if you've got a heart to rejoice in the Lord. Amen. Wouldn't you love to have people like that around you? The thing is, you can be a person like that. Because for Tom, he, uh, he's told me this, you know, several times. He didn't, he didn't always, he wasn't always like this. Even as a Christian, he said, I've had to practice being someone who rejoices in the Lord um, in my conversation. And I wanted to bring out what I felt in my heart. We can all be like that. Yeah. It means we need to spend time in God's presence so that we've got something to give. But when we do, let's be people who just overflow with how good the Lord is in, us, in our life and in the life of our church family. And, and just generally how good God is, because we've got so much to say about the goodness of God. Thank you, Lord. Yeah? We encouragement from the life of uh, Tom, Tom Pritchard. Um, Chapter 4, um, verse 5 says, Let your gentleness, brothers and sisters, be evident to all. The Lord is near. Let your gentleness be evident to all. That's one of the um, kind of sevenfold fruit of the Holy Spirit in someone's life. When God comes into someone's life, there starts to be a transformation. And some of that transformation, starts to, you start to see it over time because they become a bit more like Jesus. You can see 
the work of the Holy Spirit in them, making them someone who's a bit more loving and self-controlled. They're a bit more gentle, a bit more kind, gracious, a bit more like Jesus. The fruit of the Holy Spirit starts to be seen. And Paul is saying here to this church family, of the characteristics of God, practice this one. Let this one be the, the presenting character of you towards other people in the church family and elsewhere. Let your gentleness be evident to all. Yeah? Gentleness. And gentleness requires humility and sensitivity to how other people, the people that you're speaking to, are and their circumstances and their feelings so that you can be responsive and gentle towards them. If you don't have that gentleness, pray for it. Because the Holy Spirit can give you gentleness. And that's something I've prayed for for years. And I don't think it's, um, you know, I'm not entirely sure if people were to list my characteristics that gentleness would be at the top because I think it's still something I need to ask the Holy Spirit every day. Catherine will tell you this. Every day. Lord, I need, I need your gentleness so that I can be sensitive to the circumstances and the needs of other people. And some of that is personality, but also some of that is, is training. Because for years, I worked in the construction industry um, and I worked for a long time as a project manager. Yeah. And part of the training for me to do that job was that I had to have certain priorities when it came to what was important to get the job done. Because it was my job to get the job done. So I was working with architects and engineers and surveyors and civil engineers on really massive projects, but the client was appointing me to get the job done on time, within quality and in the right order. And sometimes my training encouraged me in fact, pretty much always, my training encouraged me to put, pe to put the project first and the, the welfare of the people that I was working with second. Yeah? Because what mattered to my client, the person who was paying my wages, was that the, was that the project got done. Yeah? And as a, as a project manager, I had to ask the Lord to help me to see people and to see their circumstances and not just care about getting the work out of them. Yeah. And in the church family, the opposite to gentleness is treating, treating people as though they don't really matter. As though all that matters is the project. Or treating people with coldness or distance. Or I couldn't really care less about you. I'm more interested in other people. Let your gentleness be evident to all. Yeah. That's the call of God for all of his people. Let your gentleness be evident to all. And if you don't think you're very good at it, please pray for it. And ask the Lord, please help me to be gentle like Jesus. Most of us are okay at being gentle towards some people, but not everybody. But the words here is to be gentle to all people. And uh, that's, a, that's a big challenge. Perhaps Euodia and Syntyche were able to show gentleness towards the people that they, that they led or they cared for or who were under their care. But perhaps they struggled to show gentleness towards each other, other leaders, other people of prominence. And sometimes that can happen in churches and in life. And Paul is saying, let your gentleness be evident to all. Realize they're who they are. That's a real challenge, right? It's such good stuff, though. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Uh, Philippians chapter 4, uh, the, the, the passage we're looking at today, I'm going to finish with this. It ends uh, like this. It says, Paul says, please don't be anxious about anything. This is a word of God for lots of us. Don't be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And here's the promise. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Lots of us are anxious a lot of the time. And uh, 
Paul's not naive here. He's not saying, oh, just switch off your anxiety, get over yourself and, and stop that nonsense. Stop being anxious. He's not saying that at all. Because actually he's learned to be gentle towards people, whatever their circumstances. And he knows that lots of us carry anxiety in our life a lot of the time, don't we? It's just me. Don't we? And so there's a word, or the, there's a word to the Lord for, for all of us who carry worry and anxiety about all kinds of different things. He's not saying just go over it. He's not saying just switch it off. What he is saying is that, brothers and sisters, we don't need to carry this on our own. We need to try and figure this out on our own. We don't need to rely on our own resources to bear the weight of our anxiety. He says, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, who is the counsellor par excellence, the one who not only made us and designed us and knows intimately who we are and what we're like and what's happened in our lives. It's not like we have to explain stuff to God. Oh my God, you would never believe what's happened to me. He would believe it. He knows it intimately. And we can take to our, we can take to our, our loving, caring counsellor everything that's going on in our hearts and our lives and present our requests and our concerns to him with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, why? Because God is a God who cares. You know, 1 Peter chapter 5 says, um, cast all your anxiety on him. Why? Because he cares for you. That's an astonishing thing to realize that every, not only Christians in the world, but every individual, and we can say with absolute authenticity, whoever you are in the room today, you can cast your anxiety on the Lord, knowing that he intimately and lovingly cares for you. Is that good news? I personally want to say thank you, Lord, that you care for me. Thank you that you've got the capacity to care for every one of us. Thank you, we don't have to make an appointment with you to see you in two years. Yeah? Thank you that our appointment with you doesn't only last one hour. We have the opportunity to come into the presence of the Almighty Counselor and cast our anxiety on him and our heart out to him. And he cares for us like a parent cares for their kids. Thank you, Lord. And he has the capacity and the ability to help us in our place of need. And it says, as we do this, uh, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding. And I've had this experience lots of times where, you know, I've tried to sort myself out so many times and then thought, oh, maybe I should pray about this, actually. <laughs> right. And as you do, you come at the presence of God, you start with worship and thanksgiving and say, oh God, you're so good, you're amazing. And you're so tender and compassionate. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you for wanting to spend time with me. And you just start to pour out your heart. And something supernatural happens. The peace of God just starts to kind of invade your life in a way that passes understanding. And you have this incredible sense, my goodness, God is, God is with me. That's what Paul says, the Lord is near. Not an amazing thing. Not an amazing thing. Thank you, Lord. The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard our hearts. And we finish with this. I'm just quoting a little bit from an old hymn that we used to sing in the church that I, when I was a kid growing up. Uh, the title of the hymn is What a Friend We Have in Jesus. And uh, I'll just quote half verses of three verses in that hymn. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden? cumbered with a load of care, precious saviour, still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. 
that thank you, Lord, for your mercy. Thank you, Lord, that although that you know my every weakness, you still love me. Thank you, Lord, that you have the capacity to spend time with me. And thank you, Lord, that you have the ability to bring the peace of God. We bless you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.